Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Fitzmorris. I'm the Vice President of Workflow Technology at a company called Nintex. It's a company that's in the workflow business. And this session is called Why Do Workflow? And typically when I present at Evolution, I've been doing this for some time now, it's typically either in the information worker track or the developer track, and I'm talking about new techniques or ideas for process design and any of a number of other things. But Steve and I were talking and it occurred to me, it's a good idea to talk about why do workflow in the first place. We often have the sense of someone coming into an organization, everyone knowing that they want to do workflow and knowing what they want to do it about, it's just a question of selecting the best tool and using the best techniques without for a moment thinking about how it will benefit the organization. So we opted with the idea of doing a two-part series. And essentially I have one presentation, I'm gonna space it out over a, a two session period. So hopefully, unless, unless I'm absolutely horrible, you'll come back for part two because I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, and that, as they say, will be that. I want to talk about why to do workflow and the right approach to take and the reasons, well, it, it will become pretty obvious pretty quickly. Uh, how about about me first? I'm actually the original SharePoint evangelist. I spent 11 years at Microsoft. Most of that time was on the SharePoint team. I actually helped launch the very first version of SharePoint. I am not the SharePoint father or the mother, I was one of the nurses in the delivery room who had to clean the kid up before giving it back to the parents. And I've been, in, to some extent, helping to clean it up ever since. The, uh, it's not a bad gig, but I, I, somebody had to go first in terms of asking people to care about SharePoint from a technical point of view. I happen to have been that guy. Obviously, the job got easier as time went on because I wound up getting a lot of help. And that's nothing but goodness. Uh, seven years ago, I left Microsoft and joined a company called Nintex. Uh, we're in the workflow business. I'm not here to talk about Nintex. If you have questions about it, if you're familiar with me or that company, feel free to ask me questions on a break. I absolutely don't mind that. But the advice I want to talk about today is completely product independent. I have been working in, in the area of workflow and process automation and human productivity and organizational productivity for going on 25 years at this point. Um, it's, I've always found human problems messier and therefore more interesting than data-oriented and transaction-oriented problems. It's not to say they don't overlap quite a bit, but I have, my, uh, I have my preferences and they generally involve organizational productivity. I have had past lives in development, past lives in uh, IT, past lives in research and development, and I certainly have been a power user in the past. Before I go any further though, I'd kind of like to ask you guys, who here is in IT? I'm expecting it to be most of you. Okay, who, uh, who's a developer by any chance? Wow, uh, now I'm guessing some of you are two-headed monsters because I think I saw you raising your hands before when I asked about IT. That's fine. Uh, who is strictly in uh, what I might call a business decision maker or a productivity person? In other words, you're not in IT, but you, you do care about making sure that people get, get things done. Knowledge manager, perhaps, might be a way to describe. Yeah, okay. Good to know. Let's begin with why to do workflow. Believe it or not, not everybody agrees on this. And it's been changing. And actually, I hope there's more than one answer in any of your organizations. But let's begin. Uh, because occasionally I get people approaching me, well, I get booths at conferences and so on, and saying, well, I'm not sure we have any workflows. We don't really have any autom or processes that are worthy of automation. In fact, worthy of automation is uh, a, a common thing I hear. Sort of like, I'm not sure this dinner or, or the, the people that we have sitting down to dinner are worthy of the good china. Uh, I, I have good china in a cabinet. It's the really nice dinnerware and I only take it out when we have guests. And that's sort of how some people worry, think about workflow. 
Unless this process is important, we shouldn't bother to go through formal automation of it. That's actually a big mistake. Typically, to save time and money is the easy answer. Everybody gives this answer. It's not wrong. It's just the obvious, easy, go-to answer that everyone uses. It's not bad, but it's woefully incomplete. However, I will say that you know, during the global economic crisis, which is still going on in some parts of the planet, this was enough. This kept businesses afloat by automating things and saving time and saving money. I actually think this is a more interesting reason to automate processes, to minimize mistakes. Because especially depending on the process, if it's a process you care about deeply and it has your attention most of the time, you're curating that. You have, uh, we have nothing to worry about. You're going to take very, very careful care. Should have come up with a better phrase than that. Uh, you'll take great care to ensure that no mistakes are made. But how many of us have the luck and the fortune and, uh, well, and the wherewithal to be able to do only the things we love and care about all day long? Me too. Therefore, there are processes we're involved in all the time that we barely care about, wish we weren't doing, and that is a recipe for making more than the occasional mistake. Automating processes can help prevent that. Now, nothing can prevent huge strategic blunders at the executive level. No software will ever take care of that. But all the little piddly embarrassing things, how about, well, I'll give you some more examples. Checklists. There are a number of states in the United States that have in the past 10 years implemented mandatory checklists in surgical theaters. Before a surgery proceeds, or before it begins, and by the way, medical professionals hate this. Well, at least doctors do. Nurses actually love it. You run through a checklist as the anesthesiologist or anesthetist, depending on what part of the planet you are in, uh, does that person have enough anesthetic for twice the amount of time the person will be under? Do we think the patient's vitals indicate that they'll be okay for that length of time? Do, does, uh, do the uh, nurses think there's an ample supply of blood on hand in case something goes awry? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Believe it or not, they catch things all the time. And mortalities in surgery have actually gone down a lot over the years. And again, it's an affront to the sensibilities of, of doctors, but everybody reluctantly or emphatically admits that it helps a lot. The aviation industry. Look, we all find aviation annoying, I suspect, in, at least in some ways, unless there's someone in here that works for an airline. Uh, but they actually run into trouble very, very infrequently compared to every other mode of transportation. Why? Because virtually everything they do involves following checklists. A checklist is an automated process. Checklists are good. Checklists help you keep, keep you from making mistakes. Uh, you know where checklists would help out a lot? Has anyone ever been involved in a tweet they really, really wish they hadn't done? Or better still, uh, not you personally, but someone at your organization tweeted something on the corporate account and turned out to be embarrassing. It was an uh, inadvertent double entendre or just lacking in wisdom. I'm all for tweets being natural and organic and not you know, overly curated, but at the same time, it's probably not a bad idea to do a reality check, run it by one other pair of eyes before going live. And having that be an automated process, well, there's some value in that. To, related to minimizing mistakes, ensuring compliance. Many of us have laws and regulations or at least internal policies that must be complied with. And it's a very, very, very good idea to make sure that that happens. Automated processes both help define what the process is meant to be and ensure that it is followed and provide a record that it actually took place. This is actually quite important when one gets sued. And despite my accent, I'm actually not American, I'm Canadian. It's like an American without a gun. Or an American who's read an atlas, 
or an American who can spell. I can go on for a while. But I live in the United States these days. I actually like Americans. I married one. But uh, I, I live, I'm an expat. I live amongst them. And one does have to be worried about getting sued on a regular basis. Either being sued on a regular basis or worrying on a regular basis. You can p parse that sentence any way you'd like. The point is, covering your, can I say ours? I'm going to say it. Uh, covering, yeah, we're going to do that. If you are a particularly forward-leaning organization, you might be doing workflow to create new opportunities. In fact, as we crawl out of the global economic crisis, this is actually a big, fat, hairy deal. It's not enough to cut costs. It's not enough to uh, be efficient. We should be looking for ways to be better than the other guys. And to be better than the other guys, well, here, I'll give you an example. This is a process that uh, grew quite organically out of a couple of people in the trenches having a very, very good idea. A, um, a shuttle driver for a hotel chain uh, was driving a couple from the airport to the hotel. Now, the couple had been up all day. Their child had been, has been crying constantly. Their, their nerves are just completely frayed. And you can tell the last thing they want to do is go through 10 minutes of check-in procedures. In fact, the, the, when the driver left the hotel, he knew that it was quite busy. Front desk was crowded. Well, he knew it was going on. And so he dialed the front desk. And he explained the situation. And they actually um, took it upon themselves to set up a room, put a cot in it, get a bottle warmer in there, put, uh, make sure it was ready. I actually also put a bottle of wine in there. And they left a note saying that just come down when you're ready and we'll take care of the remaining check-in details, but you're already sorted. They've stayed there before. They had uh, frequent guest points and so on. So they, they knew where they lived. It wasn't that risky a thing. Uh, and then they, uh, the... Uh, Bellman uh, knew, had the keys uh, standing by and so on. So everything was sorted when they walked in. They were taken care of because they sort of organically put together a process to be exceptionally nice to people that could really use a moment or two of kindness. Now that happened by accident once, but then they immediately turned that into a proper process, so they just have to do a code blue or code pink, or I actually have no idea what they call it. But they have a particular phrase for it, and that immediately contacts housekeeping, that immediately contacts the front desk, that immediately contacts the bell station, and so on. Everyone is alerted, so they understand we have someone that for one reason or another, could be because they're a very frequent high-profile guest, could be just because they really could use it. Well, for one reason or another, it's time to be nice, extra nice to someone. That's a new opportunity. And by the way, if that's ever happened, if organizations that have been extremely nice to you, you go back to those organizations. <coughs> Even though organizations technically have no personality, they do have corporate cultures. And any corporate culture that values that sort of behavior is probably worth your money. I've got a couple of different reasons for talking about why you should do workflow. Everything that I already said is absolutely true. But this is a SharePoint evolution conference. And I actually think you should be doing workflow no matter where you choose to do it. I just happen to think SharePoint is a particularly good place to do it. And workflow is one of several ways to ensure that SharePoint engagement <laughs> takes place. And engagement really is the right word. I do not mean adoption. Adoption's the wrong word. Ad adoption's a good shorthand word, and often when colleagues of mine say adoption, they actually mean engagement. I'm picking nits, but it's for a reason. I can make SharePoint adoption 100% in fewer than 30 minutes' time by going in and creating a group policy in Windows server and ensuring that everybody's homepage in Internet Explorer is our company's intranet. 100% adoption, sorted. I, may I have my bonus, please? 
doesn't really work that way if you want to make the company smarter, better, faster, stronger, sexier. What you need to do is transform SharePoint from a place where things are put to a place where things are done. Workflow does that. Actually, BI does it too. There, there are two very active uses of the SharePoint environment. One is gathering data together, harvesting it, and presenting it inside of a place. But I'm not here to talk about BI. Other people do a fine, fine job of that. I'm here to talk about business process automation and or workflow. They're, they go hand in hand. And workflow is special. Workflow means I can drop something into SharePoint, and SharePoint itself will do some things. I don't need to keep going back to it and look at it, and so on. The process will be assisted by magical elves living inside of my uh, servers and services. Now, this next one is, I'm being deliberately cheeky, if you would, but there's method in my madness. There's another big, big, reason to embrace and use and exploit workflow as much as possible to keep IT relevant. IT is constantly under, not attack, but under scrutiny because a lot of organizations still see it as a cost stream, not a revenue stream, and certainly not a strategic stream. If that's not your case, thank you, very, that's great, I, I applaud that. But this is a perception that constantly needs to be fought. And up until now, in a lot of places, planet-wide, the norm was not to use workflow, but to undergo formal projects of one form or another. Or if workflow was involved, it itself was a formal project done by professional developers. SharePoint was perceived as a resource for building solutions. And customization is king. How many of you have struggled with people who basically obsessed for hours about exactly where the logo goes in a SharePoint site? Or exactly what the phrasing should be? Should it be while or whilst or uh, any of a number of different things? Look, all that stuff is interesting and somewhat compelling, but my personal uh, sentiment is that if you're focused too much on that, you're focusing on the wrong things or you're taking too long. How about that? There is a disconnect. And by the way, this is becoming less and less important. Even though users are the ones that drive a lot of this, users are being tempted to look in other places. And why? Because things are changing too frequently the time it takes to build things in a formal way, well, it's big. It's very, very big. And increasingly, uh, it changes a lot. And it isn't in one place. As much as I think SharePoint's the center of the universe, it's a big universe. And integrating with a lot of things in a lot of places is a constant requirement, an emerging requirement. And that involves demands on users and from users to do more and more, faster and faster. Now these, this sounds like, like generic business productivity guru stuff. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is real. Here's the part that's very, very real, increasing requests for more applications. And this is the big part. The processes that you want to automate change constantly. The Gartner Group, who I will be quoting several times throughout this, uh, did a study about, this was five years ago now that they think of it. But this is what they found, which means it's likely to be worse than this now. 67% of all processes change every six months. Two thirds changed in six months time. Now that's a rate that I think we can keep up with. But 18%, one in, roughly one in five changes those things change monthly. 10% change weekly. And this part, I'm really do 4% uh, every day. I'm not sure those should ever be automated if they change on a daily basis. <laughs> but they exist. 
with the emergence from the recession, reducing costs is no longer the number one priority. It's a priority. It will never not be a priority. But taking advantage of opportunities is now the number one priority. And what has happened in a lot of organizations worldwide, the money is now in the hands of the business units, not in the hands of IT. They're the ones with the budget. If you're in IT, you need to get them to commit the dollars to doing something that you, being responsible adults, know how to deal with. But here's what's potentially perceived as competition. You shouldn't think of it that way, but you can think of it that way. <coughs> Software as a service. Because it is highly, highly tempting for a sales department to just go to salesforce.com. It's out there, it's actually highly effective, it has champions, it has advocates. L look, if you're a Microsoft shop, you can go to Dynamics CRM, it's actually quite nice too. And uh, there's no controversy here because Microsoft and Salesforce have a strategic partnership as well. Which is a little weird, but co-optition has happened before. Uh, the point is, they exist, they are popular, they charge per month, which means if it turns out they don't work out, they just get dismissed. They stop paying them money and they move on to whatever it is they really wanted to do. But they can have it tomorrow by giving them a credit card. If you're in marketing, there's a nice little package called Marketo that does a great job of marketing qualified leads and automated campaign management and a bunch of other things like that. Concur, great uh, travel and expense management system. Uh, they got bought by SAP a few months back. Slack, this is a great collaboration tool. It's not, it, it's very lightweight and very focused. It's, it's sort of almost Yammer-like, but leaner and meaner, and it's getting a lot of attention. Yammer I could put in here, although it's part of Office 365, and I'm deliberately, well, technically dynamic CRM. I was avoiding Office 365 things, but Office 365 counts. That is, uh, well, I'm coming to that in the next slide, actually. Trello, lightweight project management. Very popular in some places. You get increasing demand from users because these software as a service offerings define very clearly what they do and what they don't. They also have very carefully defined costs. And they have some extra features that would be hard to create yourself. And they're very upfront about what they don't do. And the, what they do have is a very strict service level agreement. They're very, very popular. Now, you could say, and rightly so, IT can be the facilitator for all of this and the integrator for all of this. And if so, you're reading ahead and more power to you because that's absolutely right. But they're there and they're a challenge. In the days of us doing everything as classic development projects, they're gone. Or they will be gone very, very soon. Workflow is our way out of this. Uh, I'm setting up the problem in order to position workflow as a solution. Especially because SharePoint itself is being transformed into a set of services. Does anyone use Office 365? Please raise your hand if you do. Okay, a chunk of the room does. Uh, many of you might be experimenting with it. The thing about Office 365 is that it looks a whole lot less like a set of servers. If, if you are on premises, you're still probably thinking of SharePoint Server and Exchange Server and Link Server and a few other things. Well, if you log on to Office 365, you just go to a, 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 an icon in the upper left-hand corner and you see things like mail and sites and uh, tasks and a few other things. In other words, the server providing the service is next to irrelevant. They focus on the services being provided, which means Office 365 is behaving like software as a service. Well, kind of because it is. It's also designed to be highly stable because it's being hand curated by Microsoft itself. Wide adoption is going on, which means users want what they want, Users, what users want will change on a very frequent basis. And they control the money, and they're being attracted by a whole bunch of bright, shiny objects. What do you do? What do you do? You can't manage this. Instead, you have to lead. 
and you need to transform IT into something that Gartner would refer to as, and it occurs to me, my slides have gone through a slight reformatting. I want you to imagine that uh, red oval hovering around item number five, which says bimodal IT. Now Gartner loves to sound all quasi-academic and stuff. Bimodal IT means do two things at once. Or, or have IT take on two roles. And yes, workflow is about to snap in here very, very nicely. You see, here's the deal. Bimodal IT, this is the classic IT, operational IT, focused on stability with defined services. You know, release plans, user acceptance testing, pilot staging, and all that kind of stuff. And for certain solutions and certain things that are the lifeblood of the organization, you do this all the time. Not suggesting otherwise. But look at all that stuff over on the left, where you have development focused on speed and turnaround times of 24 hours or two to four, for prototyping and two to four weeks to production. You sprint through that backlog. You get through it quickly. And you use deployable software that is quick and easy and readily available and usable by more than just specialists. In fact, if you look at the tools that are being provided or being pitched to address that situation, workflow fits very nicely because in a very real way, another reason to do workflow is because workflow can replace code. I can draw my application very, very nicely. I don't have to think of it as a... It's one thing to think about workflow as approving documents, and of course it is, but it's not only that. It's possible to have workflow actually stand in for a full-blown application. I can collect information from you in a form, run it through a process to make some decisions, fetch data from another place, bring it back, send it back to you in a certain situation, have you make more determinations or provide more input, bring that information back, do some other things with it, and finalize everything. Yes, that could be a, an app, but that could also easily be a workflow. In fact, you can make a workflow be an app on a phone. It's not a hard thing to do at all. When should you do workflow? When is a good time to automate a process? When you have consensus on what the process is in the first place. And when you have sufficiently scoped what is supposed to happen, because attempting to boil the ocean, another piece of con uh, consultant jargon, but basically if you try to do too much, it's never going to get finished. So scope it to something that's finite and doable. Get consensus as to what should be done in the first place and get people to commit to actually com uh, doing that commit resources to it. If you get those three things, I am willing to guess one of two things have happened. There's been a royal screw up. And if there's been a royal screw up, everybody knows what went wrong. Everybody knows what should have happened instead. This is a magic moment where there's supreme business clarity and you should capitalize on that. You should absolutely positively capitalize on that. Take your workflow tools, get out there with the users, the, the business decision makers that have been affected by this, and spec out what's supposed to happen normally. You'll never get that kind of clarity and, except for that moment. Well, okay, there is another time when that can happen. However, this requires everybody to feel a bit less desperate, a bit more relaxed, and that's right after a happy accident. That. Uh, that procedure of being very, very nice to a hotel guest, that was a happy accident. But those are the two times when certain kinds of processes become incredibly clear and they're worth automating at that point. How to approach workflow? Two basic strategies. One involves iterating. And the second one involves rethinking. And let me, tell, let me explain what I mean by those two things. When we iterate, this is how workflow and the, the left-hand side of bimodal IT and all, all of this works. We don't expect to get it right the first time. 
In fact, failure is a winning strategy. We love failure in this case. In fact, we believe you should fail first, you should fail quickly, and you should fail forward. In fact, if you are willing to look stupid for five minutes, you can look like a genius for five years. Here's what I mean by this. Except for those magic moments when there's been a royal screw up or a very happy accident. Exactly what to do is not so clear. Or what people believe should be done doesn't actually fit what needs to be done. And if you're going to attempt to automate it, well, your best bet is to listen to people and do exactly what they just got done telling you, no matter how horrible it is. Model what they do, a prototype based on what they told you the requirements are, on what they told you the process is, allow it to fail. Allow them to tell you where you screwed up. It's okay, you'll look dumb for five minutes, but then you'll do it properly and you'll in fact suggest to people how to improve it. See, people have a much easier time editing than creating. If I look at something that's imperfect, I can point out the flaws quite readily. If I look at a blank page and have to design something myself, I'm likely to panic. It's not necessary to panic. Iteration looks kind of like this. Here's a workflow process. I might start doing this, and then depending on uh, some, something, I might branch off and do this, and maybe something like that afterwards. These are the steps in the process. Sometimes they're referred to as actions. Sometimes they're referred to as activities. These are the things that are meant to be done. But, oh, by the way, where a lot of people get things wrong, they focus all their attention on this. Or they focus all their attention on this first. Like for example, exactly how should I contact the user and how should I put information in front of her or him to say, here's what you need to do. Uh, one of your subordinates is asking to take leave. Administrative leave, family leave, sick leave, holiday time, whatever. The point is, they've accrued this much. No one, uh, these other people will be gone at the same time. Exactly what information do you need to make the decision? We might obsess over the details about exactly what that should look like. And here, we might talk about exactly how we're going to communicate with the human resource management software in order to determine what someone's balance is. And here, we might worry about how to update it and how to inform uh, various departments and so on and so forth and how to affect the scheduling software. All of that's legit, but don't do that first because this is the sequencing of events that guides when those things happen, what is, it calls out what should happen and when it should happen and under what circumstances it should happen. This is the process. The mistake most people make is that they automate the steps first. What you should do is automate the process first. Once you get consensus on the process, then you can automate the actions. Perfectly okay to do it that way. Ideal to do it that way. In fact, the very best prototypes are just sequenced checklists. Works really well for the airline industry and for surgical theaters and all that sort of stuff. They aren't fancy. They're actually processes. They don't say how the nurses are supposed to determine they have enough blood on hand. They just say, ask them. That's okay. If you want to get fancy later, and you should, it would be best if you know what the patient's blood type is and you check it yourself so that the nurses don't have to. And you can ask them a different judgment-based question. In fact, you do enough of this, these can be Internet of Things type integrations and so on where devices tell you what the patient's vitals are. Or, for example, on my car, which is not a particularly fancy car of any sort, my tires tell me when they need more air in them. I no longer have to proactively check anything. My, my tires are, believe me, it's not a very fancy technology, but it's fancy enough to me because I never remember to check my tires. But that's iteration. Work on the process. Then automate the actions. 
And if you've got the right tools, and hint, workflow is the right tool environment, you can change the steps on a regular basis. You can modify the process on a regular basis. But again, process first, steps second, and you'll have a good time. Now that's iterating. I also want to talk about rethinking. And the best way I can think about rethinking, well, you're going to do this in stages. You will iterate in order to get to the following point. You're going to start out thinking about eliminating paperwork. And I actually, th uh, sometimes some of the marketing literature our, our company puts together talk refers to paper-based processes and being able to eliminate them. We're hardly unique in that regard. Most workflow vendors do mention that. I actually think it's 2015. Why are we talking about paper-based processes? Who still does that? Turns out, actually, I am so completely wrong. There's a lot of paper-based processes going on out there. But look, we can expand this a little bit. It could be paper and email-based processes. And, and this I am completely willing to admit. The problem that a lot of people do when attempting to do workflow is they think they're meant to eliminate paperwork but they don't remove paper thought or paper-based thinking. In fact, they basically take something that was an inefficient or, or nasty or unpleasant or not especially magic paper-based process, and all they do is turn it into something electronic. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a real thing. The, the photo, it, this is not a paper-based form. This is actually an InfoPath form that's been printed out. It looked like that at one point, and then an organization turned it faithfully into an electronic form. And just for giggles, we printed the thing out. It's 31 pages. The wrong thinking, and normally I like to be somewhat relativistic and say, look, it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's goodness of fit and efficacy and all of that. This is wrong. Don't do this. Never, never do this if it's at all possible to avoid. I've made it blurry. The photo was actually crystal clear. I deliberately blurred to protect the guilty. This should not be a 31-page form. You know why? Because if I come over here, and if I were to read the top of this page, you know what it says? It's got four magic words on it. For office use only. They say that in the UK as well, right? OK, good. Language of art terms, like uh, maximum cl er, uh, clearance versus max headroom and all that sort of thing. But fault finding versus troubleshooting, need to make sure I don't use silly, silly North American English. But in any event, uh, this is not for office use only. If you see the words office use only on anything, you have a workflow. You do not have a static form. In fact, that. This is what it should be. You should rethink this problem and turn it into this instead. It's really eight forms that are moved about, depending on circumstances, among three different people or entities or departments or what have you. Um, the, the colors represent the entities. So someone will initially submit the bits in red. It'll move on to the uh, the, the department that's represented by blue it might send it back to have extra information supplied later on. And then it might require the consultation with this particular group who might send it back to someone for more comment or move it on to them, et cetera, et cetera. There's actually branching logic throughout that form. It is a workflow process. It is insane to think of that as one big package of stuff. I'll tell you why, because you might think, OK, so what? Let's make the form really, really smart. Let's make it route itself amongst people. You know why I don't like that? Because it makes that form really, really hard to create and maintain and modify, because you know you're going to want to modify it. Has anyone worked with InfoPath on an extensive basis? You, sir, I'm going I'm to use you because you're convenient. And, and you've been nodding, so I, you're very attentive and responsive, and I appreciate that. Here, here's the deal. If you do some InfoPath work and you try to implement this in just a form and then you go on holiday for two weeks 
And someone over here also raised his or her hand. Was that you, sir? Yes, okay. And you hand him your project. What are the odds he's gonna be able to crawl inside your head and figure out what you've done? Even if you use a lot of rules, it will be difficult because it's not clear as to which rule is being fired in which sequence under which circumstances. And especially if you combine that with views and other things, it starts to get really, really hard. In fact, when you come back from your holiday in two weeks' time, I bet you're going to have trouble look crawling inside your own head. Yes. <laughs> Point is, thinking about this, like, a, like if I just take the form and I turn it into... If I just make the problem a digital version of a paper problem, I haven't done very much. I've saved some trees. That's about it. Uh, I'm probably wasting electricity. Here's the deal. Uh, the second part of it is, uh, who is absolutely not a developer? All right, I'll use you. Not extensively, just for a moment. <sighs> My point is, if you're here, if you are the, the entity in yellow, and suddenly this package of paper shows up on your desk, are you going to have an easy time figuring out where on that form you're supposed to do your part? No. No way. In fact, if the red entity gets it back, Figuring out where they're supposed to complete new information is not going to be especially clear. Why am I giving you all of this when I really just want you to do this little bit? It's crazy. We don't have to think like we have paper. You know what we can do instead? We can have one form that contains nothing but the request that goes off to a process to do some thinking and if it needs to consult with someone, it can send them a form that's very specific to their task, contains exactly what they need and nothing they don't. And then when it collects their input, like say this is a change request process. We use this from time to time. This is somebody's really good idea, your good idea, sir. So you submit this. And now we need somebody in finance to determine what it's likely to cost. Because before I give it to somebody who's a decision maker, uh, like yourself, I didn't mean you, sir, I meant her. She looks far more responsible than you. <laughs> okay, you're gonna make the ultimate decision. I trust your judgment. I hope I'm right to trust your judgment. The point is, I don't think you just wanna see his good idea. You probably wanna know what it's gonna cost. So, uh, you look very serious, and you're wearing glasses, so I'm gonna make you an accountant. And you are an auditor, an assessor, or something like that. And, and you will take a look at his idea, figure out what you think it's going to cost. Because we really don't want him to estimate what it will cost. He'll lie. Not deliberately, but he'll, he will have a favorable view of what the numbers would be. We need someone dispassionate. Actually, this is very important. It, can't be, it needs to be dispassionate. I don't want you to even know who he is. I just want you to see his idea. Because perhaps, do you work in the city or, or do you, uh, do you drive to work? No. Do you? No. All right, I want you to pretend that you drive to work. <laughs> One year ago, he parked in your parking space and you're still cross with him because of it. <laughs> Pick some appropriate slight or, or something like that to, to map it again. Both of you are above this, I know this. The point is, I don't want, you actually, he might be a good friend. I don't want you to be favorable to him either. I want you to be dispassionate. So your form contains nothing but his idea and a place for you to enter a number. Maybe a place to put in some comments. That's it. When you get it, you're not even gonna see who he is or who he is. You might like them both, you might not like, I, I don't really care, I just want you to make the decision based on the data. You get that form. It contains, it's different to that, it's different from that. It contains one place for you to put input and a lot of things for you to look at. Now, let's talk about what you should automate. What you should automate traditionally looked a lot like this. You're sitting around in your cubicle and you might be tasked 
after a while by a committee to automate processes that look like this. I have an internal procurement procedure that I'd like to uh, uh, make a whole lot more predictable, or I'd like to streamline cross-product sales and marketing lead processing. When marketing harvests leads out of our website or other campaigns or so on, we'd like them to systematically be qualified and passed to the sales automation system in a way that isn't manual, <coughs> that takes a lot of time, and that has people dropping through the cracks. Or I might need to approve loans at a bank or handle returns properly and efficiently, both in terms of what the customer service representative should do at the interaction with the customer, but also what should happen once you collect something that needs to be returned. All of these things are, shall we say, high profile, mission critical, or traditionally thought of as mission critical processes, um, front and center processes. Things that have, there are a lot of stakeholders involved. It's not just one or two people. There will be a whole group of people that will need to decide what these processes are. Should we automate these? Are they good candidates for workflow? Absolutely. No two ways about it. But this is the traditional thought. This is good China style workflow. That's all right, we, we do care about these. But this is the part that is often left on the table. And this is the part that speaks to bimodal IT and IT acting as a facilitator and IT using quick and easy workflow tools. Think about processes that work kind of like this. I need to get an expense report approved or I want to route tasks to launch a new product, or I need to review a document or have some social content that needs to be published, or I want to onboard a new employee or any of a number of things along these lines. These aren't as big. These aren't, they're still important, mind you. I'm not going to call these trivial or, low, or lightweight or simple processes. Some of them might be quite interesting. Uh, I actually think these matter a lot, but they tend to be out in the trenches, and they tend to be the processes that get in the way of what you're doing. I, I call them everyday processes. We all do them. Very few of us actually love them. In fact, because they get in the way, these are where most of the mistakes get made. These can take up half our day. If we can get these out of the way, in fact, when I want to automate something, what would you prefer to automate, sir? Something that you like to do or something that annoys the heck out of you? Probably the annoying thing. Yes, I could not agree more. Automate the annoyances. These are annoyances. There's another good reason why you should automate these. Because you'll have a much better chance of success. Why? Because, let's pick something here, I need to get, I need to onboard a new employee. So someone is about to be hired and I need to set up a computer account for them and I need to get an email box created and a bunch of other things. Who do I need to make happy with this? Yes, obviously many people will use that process, but I really only need to make one person in IT happy. One person will decide whether I got it right. It will tell me the requirements and will tell me if I got it right. Same thing with expense reports. There's one person in accounting who needs to be made happy. I make him happy, I've done my job. I should, while making you happy, think about things that involve making it easy for everybody to submit those expense reports. But in terms of who owns the process, it's you. I don't need to get a committee in on this. I have a much higher chance of being correct if there are fewer stakeholders regarding the overall process. Everyday processes are actually your friend because you can automate a lot of these and have a greater chance of success and they'll have a big business impact even if they aren't front and center high profile processes. But there is one thing about everyday processes. If you try to take them and send them to developers sitting in IT or contracted through IT, you will smother them with those requests. It's not a pretty sight. The only way to really get this done is to leave them back in the trenches and take the developers out of it and allow people in the trenches, in the lines of business to do work for themselves. This 
is not just a new type of work, because oftentimes we talk about something called low code or no code type tools in order to achieve this. But really, it involves not, it's not just a new type of tools, it's a new way of thinking. It involves something called citizen developers. This is a, ter I did not make this up, it's a term that uh, Janelle Hill, no, it wasn't Janelle Hill, oh, somebody at Gartner came up with this. Uh, it's about a three year old term, and I kind of like it. The, I, a citizen developer is not a formal developer. In fact, he or she has a day job, but they sit amongst regular people, and they use a certain easier tool set in order to create applications for those people. Citizen developers have actually been around for a long time. Let's talk about Excel. Who here has at some point in your life used Microsoft Excel? And if we go back far enough, Lotus123. It's all right. Who's used a spreadsheet? Everyone. Who's really good at it? Oh, come on. Some of you are. You're still supposed to pretend you're an accountant. Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Almost every group has an Excel jockey on it. It's usually the person tasked with doing the budget. But those people are kind of citizen developers for certain kinds of applications. They just happen to be applications designed with spreadsheets. Process automation can be that kind of thing. But citizen developers are a big deal. Citizen developers, well, actually, let's talk about where the term comes from. It's a derivation from citizen soldiers. Citizen soldiers date back to the Roman Empire. The idea was every Roman citizen had weapons. And even though they didn't use them on a daily basis, if they were threatened, the entire town could bring those weapons to bear. Napoleon actually used that to great effect in France. Today, Switzerland, virtually every Swiss citizen serves in the military for a, a year, maybe two years, I forget how long it is, but they bring their gun home. Now, they're not gun crazy, but they've got a gun, which means if the nation is threatened, virtually every Swiss adult can bring a weapon to bear without too much fuss. They're not especially violent people. If anyone is here from Switzerland, I am not picking on you, especially because I know you're armed. But the point is, the notion of a citizen soldier, uh, there, there doesn't mean you don't have specialist soldiers, but it means that the skill set required is dispersed and available everywhere, at least at a certain level of skill. Now, there is a difference about citizen development versus uh, classic development. And I'm going to play these. Uh, I've got video evidence to explain the difference. And then, when, then I think, because I think we've got roughly nine minutes left, this will be perfect. When we come back in a half hour's time, I will explain what's special about these videos. So I'm going to leave you hanging for a reason. Anyone ever do any archery? No one. OK, two dudes. Three, I think I saw someone half raise a hand. Let's pretend it's three. All right, I saw these crazy videos on YouTube a while back, and they actually kind of blew my mind, but, but for two reasons. One, it's just awesome in its own right. Have you seen this guy, Lars Anderson? A couple of you have? All right, I'm going to dissect this as it applies to workflow. Let's play this. Now, I want you to see what he's doing. This is the traditional way of doing archery. You take the bow, you put the arrow inside the bow, and you pull back and focus very, very carefully with a single eye at a distant target, and you're aiming to get precisely in the center as much as possible. In fact, some people will go so far as to use very highly specialized equipment to achieve this goal. This is a lot like traditional development long-range projects, stationary targets that are extremely well-defined. In fact, the, the way, what, what's a, an old programming, uh, oh yeah, a developer statement is, designing to requirements is like walking on water. It's very easy if it's frozen. Except in the real world, requirements just 
aren't freezable. Lots of careful measurements need to be taken. Focus is extreme and movements are very, very precise. And in fact, you really need to cultivate extensive skills in order to do this. And now, here's the wacky part. Specialized equipment too, should have mentioned that. Now here's the wacky part. Now, I'm gonna pretend everything here is new. He says he actually discovered old techniques and reapplied them to modern day archery. Doesn't matter whether it's new or it's old, it's awesome. Check this out. He's putting the arrow outside the, um, uh, the bow. He's holding the arrows in one hand, the hand that he's pulling back with. In other words, he can pull off and fire several arrows one after the other very, very quickly, as opposed to pulling one arrow out of a quiver, carefully inserting into the right place, pulling back, looking carefully with one eye, taking a long time to aim and letting go. Here he's got three or four arrows in, it, in one hand, bam, 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 bam. New techniques favor things like speed. They favor things like frequency. They favor things like being readily available at a moment's notice. They also favor a new mindset. So check this out. He's having a nice little drink and then suddenly bam, bam. Or he moves along well, and fires off a bunch of these things. Now all of this is happening at close range, at moving targets, either he's moving or the target is. And he's shooting at several things from several angles, and if he misses, he just picks an arrow off the floor, or off the wall, and reuses it. This new mindset involves a lot of short range projects, of, of focused scope. The targets, it's okay for them to move because you'll try again if you need to. And you'll reuse the resources over and over again. It's a new way of thinking, and it requires a new type of IT, where IT essentially acts as a coach. IT acts as a resource. In fact, IT kind of treats every department like a mini IT department. Every department is an IT department on a minimal scale. This is not a threat. This is actually an opportunity to coordinate that effort and act like a coach. It is okay if there's duplication up to a point. Here's what I mean by that. It's okay if there's duplication. It's okay if your department comes up with a leave request processing solution and it's okay if your department does, and it's okay if your department does, because I'm assuming the following thing could really, really happen. In your group, you just need one manager to authorize you to take holiday time. But in your group, it might require the simultaneous approval of two managers. And in your group, it might be an interdependent group of people, say a help desk, you pool uh, cases that need to be worked on, et cetera, et cetera, people are very interdependent. Or it's a consulting group where people work in pods or teams. I actually know of a couple of outfits that work this way. It's rare, but it happens. It's your peers that approve your vacation, your holiday time. Um, they're, they're the ones that have to cover for you, so if they authorize it, you can take whatever time you're authorized. Here's the thing that all three of your groups have in common, though. You need to make sure no one takes holiday time to which they have not uh, been entitled. In other words, you accrue a certain number of days per year. You shouldn't be taking more than that without there being extenuating circumstances. What's more, when time is approved, it needs to be recorded because there are compliance issues that must be conformed to. It's okay if there are several different leave request systems percolating throughout the organization. They might need to be different, but if IT is there to point out that human resources needs certain details to be taken care of, it's going to be fine. Your solution will sort that, as will yours, as will yours. Effectively, you have something referred to as holacracy, a holistic approach to what's going on. In other words, you centralize the what, and you decentralize the how. 
you give people freedom to attack things the way they need to in their own groups, as long as you make sure the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and the resources are there to help them. Now, I will go through this, exactly how this works in hour number two. The watchword will be integration is king because a lot of workflow, in fact, modern workflow and a lot of the role that IT will face in a situation like this, it's all about integration. Integration of content, integration of data, integration of applications, integration of people. But if I check, it looks like it's time for me to be there. In fact, in, I really should have finished four minutes ago. Please go out, get coffee, get water. We'll come back. We'll hopefully have some fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>